not in that state. Instead of being that window, we don't want to be a window forever. Because what happens? You always need exterior motivation. I got to get motivated to work out. <laughs> That's the shape you're going to be in. You're going to be in the shape you're going to be in if you need motivation all the time. Once you get going, then results come. And that's something that we need to understand. We're too much into this two-minute chazuk videos. Right. <laughs> it doesn't work. It's like, can I, do you have an app to work out for two minutes to lose 30 pounds? Two-minute ads. Two-minute nothing. There's nothing in two minutes that's going to get you anything. And you have to get out of that two-minute mindset. Very, very important. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Okay, well, you can answer. Um, repeat the question so they can hear it. Yeah, so I think the question was that there's, for, for this uh, woman, there's two aspects to thanking. There is the thanking for the problem itself, which is one of Barry Nachman's greatest chidushim, right. uh, that changes lives instantaneously, the act of thanking for the actual problem. And then the other thing was, again, sorry, do you remember? Thank you, Thank you for the gratitude. Ah, so I don't do that one yet. I didn't. I didn't know that that was a one, but um, but I, I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I I thank Hashem for whatever will be, um, but not necessarily that I will have the success that I intended on having. Because the truth is, one of the biggest shifts for me was like Gedalia said, it's a shift in expectation. Whereas in the past, the way that I grew up was. And the way that I thought was, I am going to control, manipulate, and cause something to take place. And when you're younger, that can actually happen. The issue is when you become an adult and you go out into the world, right. that blows up in your face big time. No lose matter, your imagination. Yes, no, lose your imagination. no matter how charismatic you are, no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how many resources you have, Hashem will make it blow up in your face. So therefore, what is uh, for me, what is very, very important was a big shift. I don't control the events in my life. The Gemara says that if a person tells you that he tried hard and he didn't learn, don't believe him. If he tried, uh, he didn't try hard and he learned, don't believe him. But if he tried hard and he learned or he achieved, believe him. Or sorry, he learned. So the question is, why doesn't he say that he achieved it? Why does he say that he ended up getting it? And the answer from the Gemara is that we do not cause the uh, outcomes of the events in our life. We only cause the effort that we put into it. The outcome of the event is Hashem himself. So if you understand that all of your um, free will comes in the domain of what is my hishtadut, what is the effort I put in, but that the actual result, and this is not the way that we usually think of it, is a completely separate entity. It's not the result of my effort. This is now, I did this. It's like pulling uh, you know, the jackpot. Mm -hmm. Not that I ever gambled or anything like that. But if you went and you did one of these, so that gives the ability for the whole thing to start spinning. So this is, I'm understanding that that's me putting in my effort. But then what happens after that is not up to me. So for instance, when I started teaching in the beginning, I would get very disappointed, let's say I had a big class. And then all of a sudden one guy comes in, he's picking his nose. So for me, that was very disappointing. And I was wondering what's wrong with me. Is there an issue here? And I have uh, self-critical and X, Y, and Z. And as time goes on and you realize that there really is no difference, let's say between Buch Hashem Gedalia having a beautiful class like this. And let's say if only one person came because that is not in my control at all. Only the effort that we put in in producing the class is on us. And when you realize that and you shift your energy that way, then the gratitude can be very, very energetic and, and, and can uh, a tremendous purpose. But when you, you have to think in advance because we, we, we have a danger of falling into a victim mindset. So the reason why you have to thank Hashem for the problems is because the bottom line is that knowledge has been concealed from you. The reason why you're going through that is con it's a concealment. And we have to be careful that if we get into anger or resentment or any of these modes, we can get into a con constriction consciousness. That's the dangerous part. Because then you'll focus more on the problem, not the solution. So why we say thank you in advance, because we believe our creator created the world out of mercy and he only wants to give to us. And we just don't understand why. So you can think in advance 
not because you know everything, but you, it, it, it's the danger of recognizing that when you get to knowledge in life, you recognize you know nothing. Right. So sometimes the reason why I feel bad in the first place is because I'm giving it a different meaning. And the meaning is only giving based on my perspective. And what happens, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this is a blessing in disguise. So we want to get you to a heightened state of consciousness to thank in advance, which is the Muna, which is a Muna. And that thanking in advance will help you understand why it happened to you. That's why our sages say first is Amuna, then comes knowledge. So the first stage is you need to run to the light and recognize it's one. Then I'll get the I'll get I'll, I'll, I'll know why it happened to me. Versus how come this happened to me? Then you lose your amuna. So you always want to run to the gratitude, even if you don't understand. You could say, Hashem, I, I believe you, but I don't understand you. It's perfectly honest to say that. But you have to run to the to the oneness because when you start separating one, then it becomes two. And this is the source of all problems. When one is not one anymore, when one becomes two, then I start blaming you. I start becoming a victim. I start I start becoming, unfortunately, he did that to me. Look what happened to me. That's what we have to be careful with, which is very hard to. Yes. He talks about in lesson 155. He says, faith gives you patience. Remember, ultimately, if you get something that's premature, imagine you had a woman was pregnant and she says, I want to give birth in six months. You kill the child. You think you're doing yourself a favor. I can't deal with the pains. Give birth in six months. It would ultimately kill the child. It would be the worst thing for the child. So you have to understand some things take nine months because the, according to that time, the patience in the vessel is built. The vessel is built through the patience. And ultimately when we sin, what happens when we sin? We had no patience. That's why we sinned. So what happens? Because you sinned and you didn't have patience, you know what you need to do? Now you need to wait. You ultimately have to rectify the same problem that got you in the problem. The problem is I have no patience. So now, because I want to control things. Right. So literally I have to do the complete opposite and wait and hold and, be, and have faith, which is the hardest thing to do. Yeah. But that's exactly what needs to be done. I would also add, add something as well. Um, Rabbi Nachman teaches in the sixth Torah on something very, very deep and practical. Sure. That is that there are several levels of the soul. The highest level of the soul is called Keter, which means crown, which is uh, Hebrew for Corona, by the way, just that's something to think about. No, I can't even hear that word. Okay, sorry. I meant the beer. I didn't no mean word. the disease. We don't, we don't say that word. I was just talking about the in beer Florida, on vacation now. I was hoping you give me one. Okay, so, so anyway. <laughs> um, Anyway, <laughs> sorry. So Keter is the crown. Okay. Now, very interestingly, what does he say is Aramaic? This word Keter, it's Qatar. Qatar means waiting. Okay. Now, in Western society, in capitalistic society, in 2021, what do we only think about? Achieving our goals. We do not realize that the highest goal possible and the highest achievement is called patience. Patience, says Rabbi Nachman, is not a means to an end. Patience is an end. If you realize that patience is not, so to speak, the mechanism that I need to get me to that point that I'm waiting for, and you realize and you have a paradigm shift, that really it is the greatest goal in and of itself, the highest revelation of, revelation of my soul is called patience, then you can actually get excited about being patient. Then it's not a matter of, oh my gosh, I have to grind and I have to wait for this thing to take place. Instead, realizing that the patience itself is a higher revelation of your own soul than the actual outcome taking place in a certain way that you wanted to. So it's a reorientation of the way that you look at success. When you think of success, we were trapped 
and uh, connived by society to teach us that when it goes the way we want it to, we have succeeded. That's not true. If you're only in control of your effort and you're not control of the result, so then your success cannot be based on what happens after the fact. However, we see that in truth, the deepest, deepest, deepest attainment you could possibly have is called patience. Rabbi Nachman literally says that this is called the land of Israel, that this birthright that Hashem gave to us, that we're supposed to teach to the world, this heightened state of consciousness is called waiting. And this is something that we never think about because we think we just have to wait. But imagine if you were excited to wait because you realize that waiting, so to speak, is me capping out on my soul's potential. Amazon waited seven years to make money. Amazon waited seven years to make money. Waiting is also a cleansing. Yeah, sure. There's a cleansing that's happening. When somebody's single, they're waiting, and they're trying, and they're praying. That's a cleansing. That's actually a cleansing. So you have to understand, the bride wants to be married, but she's got a big red stain. Wait till we clean it. Otherwise, it's going to backfire. So waiting, and remember, why do we get so impatient in the first place? Because we're not conscious of time. Lesson 61. If you tell a four-year-old, let's go to Orlando, you know what he'll tell you? Are we there yet? What time are we going there? What are you there? So tell this four-year-old, you know, you can't, you have to wait. Tell a four-year-old, why can't a four-year-old understand waiting? Because f f to a four-year-old, on his consciousness, four hours is forever. But go tell your mother four hours, it's totally no big deal. So you recognize the reason why we're impatient is because we're not, we're not focused in the process, like he's saying here. If you understand that the moment is now, that is the moment. If I'm chasing another moment, and you see this all the time in recovery, I say, how do you, how do you guarantee a relapse? Two things. You get into a relationship in treatment. Believe it or not, I have not gone to a rehab wedding yet. Okay, and there's plenty of relationships. There's plenty of relationships. Why? Because they're covering one addiction with another addiction. They don't want to deal with the trauma, but now they're, they're in love. They just met the person, I don't know, a week ago, two, two days ago. And all of a sudden, what happens? It's just a cover up. It's not real love. It's a cover up. I'm in pain. You're in pain. Let's be in love. It's not real, obviously. And the second one is if you rush the hour. You rush the hour. I want to go home. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'll book you a nice seat back. And it happens every single time. Because until they recognize this is what they have to go through. This is a spiritual process. This is not a quick fix. Get my certificate into DMV and be happy. And, and now I can drive. No, this is a spiritual enlightenment with the new, the new, your new identity being created. You think it's going to be in, in a, a week? So that you know already, forget it. The guy's going to relapse. Guaranteed. Because he's already has the same problem with the addiction. What is addiction telling you? If I just get high, I'm going to be happy. And then what happens? They come back with shame. It's the same pattern. I need another moment to be happy. So once you need another moment to be happy, you know what's going to happen when you get to the next moment? Then you're going to need another moment to be happy. And then your whole life, what are you doing? You're just running from one moment and this is what we call today fear of missing out. Right. People are at a party. Where's the other party? Nothing, nothing's good enough anymore. This is coming from fear of missing out, of not being in the moment. Right. The same reason why you're in dinner with 20 friends and you have to take a picture of the food. It's not enough that you have 20 friends and everybody's enjoying. Now you need to take a picture of the food now. You understand? It's just so, there's not, a, nothing is good enough. No moment is good enough. I need to be somewhere else. You have to learn how to shift and say, I'm doing this, this is enough. Yeah. I'm doing this, this is enough. Because otherwise, you get nothing. You get a little bit of this, you get a little bit of this, you get a little of this, and you get nothing. This is why air signs have a hard time making decisions. Because they start something, okay. They start something, they move on to the next thing. No, let me do this. No, let me do this. Let me do this. You know what happens? Then they have a midlife crisis when nothing gets done. And they completely... Go crazy. Yeah, 100%. One thing, do it, finish it. Next. One thing, do it, finish it. And this is exactly the ego. The ego tells you the moment is not enough. It's not enough this moment. You need another moment. Right. And then your whole life, you're going to be chasing moments and getting nothing. I think it's really hidden and undercover also. And I, I think that there's a root that you don't see. Not you specifically. We don't see. 
And that is that we're not happy with ourselves. And that because we don't think that we are good inherently, we have to chase after it. One of the deepest things that Rabbi Nachman teaches and Chasidu teaches is that you have a piece of God inside of you. That is good. You can't change it. Even if you did the most horrifying things that nobody in the rest of the generation has done, that piece of you has never changed. There is a part of you which is inherently good. When you try and actively tap into that part of yourself every day through talking to Hashem, you tap into that part of yourself by learning about that piece of yourself. Then you don't need to wait, so to speak, for something to take place quickly for you to be happy. Or for instance, I always had fear of missing out. I remember when I was in college. This takes know. a lot of effort. This yeah. takes a lot of effort. Sure. You go from like frat party to frat party. Everyone was horrible. You're sweating profusely through your clothes. The music is terrible. And you're thinking about how I can get to the next one. And I remember going to the next one. It was worse. And now I have guys bumping up on me like me and Gadal are doing right now. And then you have later <laughs> on, you have more. <laughs> uh, over and over. And every time that I went to another place, I was thinking about what's going on in the other place. But the real truth is I'm not happy with myself. I remember I had a friend who told me I'm not very connected to social media now, so I don't really know all the things that are going on like I used to. Uh, but no, I nothing's going on. Okay, on. <laughs> I, I heard <laughs> I, nothing's going on, just in case you know. I, I heard from my from from my best friend in Israel that there is a person who is very successful and he's a forward thinker, he's a pioneer in thinking. And he is actually trying to move to another planet and create his own civilization. I, I think he's very well known. And this, and I started laughing when he told me this. And he said, David, you know, I didn't laugh when you gave your whole sermon about Torah and about this and that. Why are you laughing at me now when I say this one thing? I said, I'm so sorry, I'm not laughing at you. I just, uh, and I, and, and Hashem plopped this idea in my head, which I feel is so true. And I thought about it a lot since. The less happy you are inside, the further you have to go to find it. Beautiful. And and I and I really believe this is Emmet, that this is true. And you'll see that through Rabbi Nachman's teachings and that you try and bring them into your own and personalize them for yourself and act on it, you will see that actually this thing that you're looking for outside of you is really inside of you. And the more you fill that up, the less you have to go to actually find it. Exactly. That's why the courts are being quarantined. You tell the guy that they have quarantine for 35 minutes and everybody will walk around. But 14 days by myself, forget it. days by myself what the heck am i going to do for 14 days by myself that was the worry that means i can't spend a week by myself calm that was the worry so that's teaching you how, how our society and one of the best ways not to get corona is to do his both to do do you know what the, the do quarantine you, yourself do you know what the hebrew word for for, for uh, isolation is no. in Israel? Both to do. it's called bidud. 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 bidud that literally the process that hashem put us all in across the world is that we should take a break from our external lives and do something called bidud, literally, that we have been decreed to do ibodidud across the world. Exactly. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. I think we'll, we'll end there. Any more questions? Are we good? I think Lavia. Yes. Go ahead, please. I mean, they're, they're, you, whatever you're feeling, you know, God always sends you. It's like almost like you have a you have a car and you have a red light. That's what you need to fix. A feeling is languages of the body. So obviously, feelings. When a person has a feeling, that means you have stagnant energy. Usually, you have a, a feeling of fear. So that's the feeling that you need to work and you have to elevate. The purpose of emotions. Sorry. The, an emotion is is a signal to change. So God's sending you an emotion of fear to tell you you're not trusting. Or he's showing you an emotion of sadness to say maybe you've had an expectation. An emotion is telling you you need to change either procedure or perspective. It's telling you to move. And that's why the word emotion in Latin means to move. The worst thing you could do is get an emotion and suppress it. Get an emotion or, or express it. You an emotion is telling you to move. That means the work has to be done. I have a whole class on that. I think last week's class. But emotions are signals to change. So when you have an emotion, for example, if I'll wake up with all of a sudden fear, then my hisbodidut will be about trusting in God. Why am I not trusting? What am I not trusting? Where have I that trust? Where did that trust fall to? Or all of a sudden I walk around very just in a negative mood. Okay, 
why am I walking around like this? Maybe I had an expectation that it's somebody did. Or maybe I got to take things personal. Why am I taking personal in the first place? So what you're doing, you're basically taking the emotion, you're ripping it apart, and then you're elevating it. That's the purpose of an emotion. I, I can show you a consciousness chart on how to do that. But that's really what we're doing is we're taking these emotions, we're ripping them apart, we're naming them to tame them, and then we're elevating them through the opposite. That's exactly what you do with an emotion. The last, the worst thing you want to do is take an emotion and bury it in. Because then what happens? You bury it. And next thing you know, you're holding negative energy. Then all of a sudden you become moody. You become, you're holding things in. Yeah, I, I would, I would uh, add to that and say that this is really one of the essential reasons why he voted to do so life transforming. Yeah, it's such a game changer. And especially the earlier you can do it, like Adalia says, if you don't do it early in the day, you're not going to do it the rest of the day. Um, you have to make this number one priority and do it as, as early as you can, because life is going to happen to you. And then it's going to become very difficult for you to, to follow through with it and to function. But when you do it, you know, Rabbi Nachman brings a pasuk that King David who had a lot of emotions, mm -hmm. but he also did a lot of hibodidut, right. and he became the Mashiach as a result, the king who's going to redeem all of us. So he said that my heart is hot within me, and I spoke out. Right. So he says that you see from this pasuk, what is David saying is the key to dealing with yeah. intense emotions? It's the speaking Speak out of them. It's the speaking out. I even heard, I don't know if this is true, that when Freud started psychotherapy, which we obviously know now is a worldwide phenomenon, he started with women, and he would tell them to speak to the wall for one hour straight, the mm. blank wall, which is very Sounds interesting. Like today, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they got better from it, right? Because they knew they were speaking to a blank wall, as opposed okay. to when they speak to the they, 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 <laughs> they didn't know they when didn't they when they right. signed yeah. up. But uh, but but it's interesting because the whole concept of they spoke for one hour straight to a blank wall there was nothing projecting itself back that itself was healing for these women that was the beginning of psychotherapy in the world That's and we awesome. yeah right and we see so we see that this is mamash uh this is the speaking you got to talk it doesn't mean you have to tell everyone what's going on. It doesn't mean that you have to tell uh, everybody all the stuff that's going on, but you have to have a time every day that you do say those things. You know, I have, uh, I'm just being uh, as honest as I can be because this is very, very important to me that everybody has the best chance to move out of their situation. I've seen therapists for years since I was 10. Every year seeing another therapist, another more than I can fit in all my limbs, okay? For the past three years, thank God, Bo Hashem, I haven't seen a therapist for the first time in my life. Okay, what's the reason? It's not because I don't have a therapist. I still have a therapist. I just have a different one. That uh, <laughs> that Nisim Black says that uh, your God is your therapist, and I could talk to you for free. I wish I said it as cool as him. I can't say it as cool. As him. But 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 this is you would need one. There, there is no way that you do not have a way to express what's going on inside of you. As long as you're not expressing those emotions, they become much more intense and they become much more destructive. So you have to every single day say to yourself, not if I have time later, I'll talk to Hashem. Not like this, like the same way that people in our generation run after money. I tell people all the time, if you run after Hashem, like you run after money, you're going to have tremendous joy in your life. And the second part of this book is to really get checking in. The whole point of checking in is, yes, Hashem, I know I'm arrogant. I need to work on it. So you don't need to be reminded of things. So basically, it's the concept of double jeopardy. You have the ability to take anything you're going through. Let's say you have an anger issue. Let's say you have an issue with uh, impatience. You should say, yes, I'm impatient. Yes, I'm angry. I need to work on this midah. It's destroying my life. It's taking so much of my energy. Once I admit it, what happens? Punishment is canceled. That means the reason punishment exists in the first place is in the absence of chuba. So the minute I say I made a mistake, I am sorry, I did this, they don't need to remind you in heaven of who you are. So basically humble yourself or you will be humbled. So we have the option to take the judgment in our court by, by saying, yes, I have an issue. Yes, I have a problem with this. I'm not running away from it, but that at least will be able to cancel the judgment because it doesn't become an upper judgment. Upper judgments only come when you have an issue, you ignore it, you pretend you don't have it, and then heaven will remind you of your issue. That's the only purpose really of, of a judgment, of a punishment is to get your attention. The whole purpose is to get your attention. But if you already check in, I don't need to be reminded of who I am.
Good. Any more? Great. Great. Yes. It will be recorded. Yes. The battery's almost dead, but we're still hanging on. <laughs> if you guys all do we're still hanging on. right now, we will get through. We're still hanging on. The battery's still. You have about seven, eight minutes, and then the battery's going to die. Yes. So there's a concept called boundaries or burnouts. First, sometimes you need the boundary. There's no way that person could be helped at that moment. There's sometimes there's no way that person could be helped because the person's not helpful and you don't have, and you're just going to get dragged into it. So you have to know how to put proper boundaries. It's healthy for you to put proper boundaries. And the next thing is really, really the first thing, obviously I deal with tons of people that are, that they're underneath. Unfortunately, they're, Reb Nachman has a great story called Turkey Prince. The person's a prince, but they're acting like a turkey, but they're not a turkey. The difference between I'm acting like a turkey, I'm a prince, I'm acting like a turkey, but I'm, I'm not a turkey. So there's a great class that put steps on how to elevate people. It talks about seven steps on how to build a person's self-esteem. I would recommend that class. It goes into details on literally how to work with people who are, who are just in a very, very bad mindset. And it basically talks about doing one thing at a time. And you can't make it your project. And you have to literally hold the hand and just think about compassion, listening. And then it's a process. I, I could send you the class on that. It's a whole class. It's not, it's not for a two minute conversation. But if you can't handle the bound, you got to put boundaries many times. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a pattern throughout the entire tour over and over again. There's a first a process of separation. And there is a sweetening that even though the way that we learn, and obviously when you come from families or friendships where they don't learn these things necessarily. So as a result of that, they may not realize that the behaviors that they're doing with you are unhealthy for themselves and also for you. And then therefore they feel that you're doing the wrong thing because of that, which is very, very, very difficult. However, the greatest thing that you can actually do for another person is find your own fulfillment. We see with Noah that he had to get on a boat. We see with Abraham that Hashem said to him when he was looking for good in his life, he was looking for Hashem. He said, Lech lecha. you have to go for yourself to find yourself. And when you leave your father's home, the place you grew up in, your country, you'll go to the place that I'm going to show you. So the obvious question is, just tell me where Hashem is. Like imagine if I said, do you want to hang out for Shabbat? You guys want to come over. Where do you live? Just leave your house. And then what? Leave your society. Okay, great. And then leave your country. And then what? You'll be in the place that I'll show you. This is a very bizarre way to explain in the most critical moment in history when you want to reveal yourself to humanity, how to get to me. But the answer is when you leave all of those things, you're automatically in the space of Hashem. Because there are many things which are blocking us from being able to experience Hashem in our life. And therefore, there is a period of time, and I've seen this very often, that you need to, so to speak, separate for time, not in a way of selfishness. You're not doing it in order to hurt anybody, but because you're not able to fill up your cup. In the Torah, it says that you want to be a cup that you're filled up with water to the extent that the water is overflowing, that you do not need to go put your water in somebody else's cup. It's automatically flowing out. And Rabbi Nachman says in the eighth Torah of the Kutub Iran, you need to be very, very uh, aware and cautious of trying to help other people when you yourself are not well or completely. 
because, and he says that if you do not get to the point that you have attained a very high level of mastery of emotions, of psychology, of spirituality, it's then it's forced. Then automatically, when you try and give that person, you will automatically be brought down with them. So to know in your mind that I'm doing that person a favor by making this boundary, even though they might feel that you're hurting them, you are actually doing it for selfless reasons because I know that if I go there, you're going to get worse and I'm going to get worse. And it's just a period. And to understand that Bezrat Hashem in a year, in a few years, you'll be able to come back with a smile on your face. You won't get so frazzled when they speak to you about all the stuff that they're going through and they might even ask you for advice and you won't be shifted but that will take a period of time so to speak that you go in the hyperbaric chamber of Rabbi Nachman and hopefully you'll come back out uh, exactly. very refreshed Not easy. Not easy. yes last question Absolutely. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.